it, so let me just my repeat. bad let me yeah you guys who's gonna be I know. okay so Akaya just reported on her paper. It was about women's rights. And um, she, you know, she obviously has read up on a lot of this pay gaps, Gloria Steinem. Um, 1.2% of women were college educated in 1950, which is interesting because my mother had a master's degree um, before 1950 and my mother-in-law did. So um, I didn't realize it was that small a percent. And they weren't raving feminists. They were just good students. Uh, but anyway, that, that's interesting to me. Um, and then perceptions about race and white privilege. But her conclusion is that, that her, your generation has adapted to the levels of inequality among women and racial inequality and they're focused on other issues um, like non-binary equality, uh, animal rights, climate change. So we'll see what happens. Um, and that's what she said. And then Jason responded and agreed. And now Mary Hannah is going to comment and we're gonna have a real recording of this class, bravo. Okay. I have a question for Arkaya. So did you say that you don't think women's quality has improved much over the years? No, like yeah. I know I was saying like we have fought for women's equality and it has changed, but I just feel like as a whole, it won't just like go away. It won't deplete, you know, yeah. Okay, I don't understand. Cause I was like, I remember growing up and being a girl that played baseball until I was in like eighth grade and I got judged by so many people. But then now you look and there's females playing football and NFL and in college playing men, men's sports. And so. I would say for the most part, when I went to, when I was in college, only 5% of the people in law school and med school were women. And now they're 50%, right? So the, the real problem for women is when, when you have kids, if you, get, if you have kids trying to juggle the career and the family, and that's when women you know, fall back. But there isn't enough energy, I don't think, because too many women just say, I don't care about the rat race, you know? Uh, and um, so there are, you know, there's the glass ceiling problem. And just let me give you one example, but I understand how it's just, there isn't the energy there anymore. There's so many women defending uh, patriarchy, which is really surprising to me, but here's one example. Okay, so uh, new startup companies in Silicon Valley, right? There's a place you could make big bucks, but you have to get a loan, right? You have to get some new venture capitalist to invest in your idea to start uh, a new Silicon Valley company. Does everybody understand that? Okay, how many, what percentage of new venture uh, capitalists um, new ventures in Silicon Valley. What percent is run by women? Everybody has to guess. Titus. Um, I have no idea. I'm just going to throw out a number. I'd say 15. Okay. Akaya? Uh, about 7%. Caitlin? Um, 25%. Okay, Mary Hannah. Well, I was going to say 25, but now I'm going to say 30. Trey? This is, you know, this would be important for women to be able to really be successful, right, in business. 
they would have to get capital to start a Silicon Valley. Go ahead. I heard, I heard the question, but I kind of want to get the answer right. So can you repeat the question? Just what percentage of the money that's put into new computer high tech companies are companies run by women? Two, 20, 20, 27, 28. Okay. Like Lakesney? Yeah, turn your mic on. 37. What? 37. Okay. And 37. Uh, I'm going to go with like a handful. So, part like, I want to say like sub 10, maybe less than 10. Uh, anywhere. Okay. So I got my data. It was a while ago. So maybe it's changed. Three. Three. <laughs> okay, guys. So, you know, there are these pockets. The higher up you go, the more, you know, women fall away. So that that's just FYI. I think, though, the reason there isn't the outrage is because they can go to school. They can go to graduate school um they can you know not very often people will say i got a lower grade because i'm a woman there's a lot of data where it's not the same but it's subtle things like how many times women get called on their sexual harassment problems but they just aren't enough it's not like only five percent right of women in med school and law school um all right so Anybody, so now we do class number 10, your reactions to Martin Luther King, letter from a Birmingham jail, um, that whole tradition, Black Lives Matter, whatever. Anybody want to start? Titus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just have a few quotes that I just found interesting. The first one we kind of talked about yesterday, but the opposite. Like it says, whatever, well, Dr. King said, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So I kind of found that interesting, especially since what we're talking about now, because it's mainly referring to those who are spectators, people who see things but don't react and them not realizing that they're actually part of the problem instead of thinking they have nothing to do with the problem. And this partially has a lot to do with women's rights and people focusing on other things. They don't realize that by not doing nothing, they are contributing to the problem. And the second quote I have, He was saying that there have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in the nation. For some reason, that gave me kind of Breonna Taylor vibes when they were really just trying to stall out that court case until the point where they couldn't. So I kind of. The statute of limitations? kind of yeah that's going on right now incidentally but i'm not going to tell you the context um, oh it was that i forgot what it was called but you talked about it in the one of the pre-classes <laughs> videos i can't remember it but i do know what you're talking about it was about a law i cannot even think of it it'll come to me later but the Last quote I talked about was him saying, it is unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham, but it's even more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left the Negro community with no alternative. And I feel like it's pretty much the entire root of Black Lives Matter today. Like all of this is going on because it's been, action has been delayed so long to where we basically have no choice but to protest and do everything that we're doing because we went so long without being 
not just heard, but no action going on. Okay, last summer when I taught this, the first comment a student made was, this could have been written last week. Did you feel that way? I'd believe it if I was written last week. It probably has been written by somebody. Okay, all right. So the same trends exist, right? The same patterns. And that's why I like teaching Greek stuff because it's teaching you how to identify trends and patterns and the things that do change and the things that don't change. So fear of the other, fear of someone that doesn't look like you or you know a history, it's very hard to overcome an entrenched history, but it is important and liberal education, right? Liberally minded people are the ones who should lead because they're liberated. They don't do anything because of custom and habit, but they don't overreact. They understand the rule of law like Socrates. They, they work within the system, even though the system will condemn them. Does, that, does everybody understand that? That this is, this is the Western tradition. Um, and King knows that. He refers to Socrates, Augustine, Aquinas. He's a traditionalist in the tradition that this class is trying to pass to the next generation, basically. Does that make sense to you, Titus? Okay, so Akaya, what about you? So for one of, I also um, had a quote that I got from the letter it said that society must protect the robbed and punish the robber. So like going off of what Titus said about how with like the whole Black Lives Matter, there's so much happening and it takes so long for people to react that we do have all these protests and like with the whole Breonna Taylor thing and the whole George Floyd thing, like it took them so long to sentence the man who killed him. And even like not with Black Lives Matter, even with like, um, I know I've read about stories about women being like raped and stuff and people were like, well, she shouldn't have wore this or she shouldn't have had this on. And it's just like, well, if they're the victim, then you should always um, protect that victim. Even, you know what I'm saying? Like, because if a woman is raped, it doesn't matter what she had on. It doesn't matter what the circumstances, you shouldn't have raped her or you shouldn't have touched her inappropriately, so. Isn't, don't you, haven't you ever heard the expression blame the victim? Okay, who wants to comment on? I'll comment. Go ahead. So um, the rape they're talking about actually, um, I just watched a TV show and that was the scene and they talked about, um, now they call it like date rape where they just um, have different, types of names of it and the woman in it commented on it and was like it's uh, uh them just trying to take away from the situation to make it seem less than it actually is and that's just like I feel like they're changing that name just to try to blame the woman like they blamed her on what she wore if she flirted or not and just things like that and so if she drank that's another yeah, and drink yeah that was one too yeah but that just stood out to me well i remember reading that 85 percent of rapes are people you know people who you might at one point have loved uh it they involve alcohol so in general i wasn't a mother that had a lot of rules and regulations but when they went to college i said do not drink and find yourself in a room with someone of the opposite sex. You know, just don't do that, okay? Don't think it can't happen to you. So that was about the only thing I told them based on research, right? And my son was in a fraternity where somebody did that and got accused of it. And then his whole fraternity got accused of being rapists. Um, but at least it came close to home and he learned stuff, right? He, he learned, that's college, you learn stuff like that. Okay, Akaya, any other comment? Well, I just wanted to say that um, my dad would always tell me like, 
if you do drink like a soda or anything, like if you walk away from it, make sure you get a new drink. Don't drink the drink that you've had because anything can happen. So yeah. Just that kind of stuff. Yep. And there was a student at Lyon. She went to the duck blind or something and got drugged. Um, any other comments? Who wants to go next? I can go next. Or you okay. can go, Jason. Yeah. I'm just kidding. I don't care. I'll go. Yeah, you go. Sorry. So just kind of going off the whole pattern idea um, that you talked about. I actually had a lot of things highlighted. I enjoyed reading this, but one was the nonviolent direct actions. And it was kind of like the marches and the protests that kind of um, like the same thing happened with the Black Lives Matter movement. I actually marched myself. Um, but one thing, um, I always wondered why those nonviolent direct actions turn into violent. You know, I was thinking, I took a trip. I'm sorry, he's in the back. Okay. <laughs> but um, um, I went to Nashville a few weeks after they had a bad, like they were blowing things up and just situations like that. And that was kind of sad to me because downtown historic Nashville, where I visit once a year at least, was gone. Like historical buildings that, you know, we always made a point to see when them was just gone. And um, so then, one paragraph. I have to actually find out how it on page eight. Um, talked about why, and it said, "Those of us who employ nonviolent direct action, and if they refuse to support our nonviolent efforts, a million people will, out of frustration and despair, seek. Um, basically, if they're not listening, then that is why it turns into a violent. Obviously, they're trying to, you know." get a point across and I just that kind of stuck out to me because I've never been a violent person but I mean I do understand why even though I don't necessarily agree with it getting to that extent even though it is something big enough to get to that extent so then I don't you have know. to find out what percentage right it's very right. important to get the data what percentage because it, it can be a very low percent right. and yet it's very visible right so yeah, I the data I got was ninety three percent nonviolent, right? Mm -hmm. So it just takes a few. Then there are the people that instigate violence, right? The undercover police officers that go in and start violence because they want it to be discredited. Mm -hmm. And then there are the opportunists, right? So there's always these different camps. Um, so you just have to expect you would be misunderstood, but you just have to keep getting the evidence and the data. What percent? What percent? Right? Right. Yeah. And then another thing that I really liked was the unjust versus just laws. Yeah. And they had the Hitler example um, that I really liked. And it was, we should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal and everything that Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hung Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. So basically, <laughs> but yes, um, that also stuck out to me a lot. And then another point I made, which I did a lot in this one, but um, was um, MLK was like, use Christianity a lot. And then he was accused of being, um, an extremist but then he compared it to like Jesus also being accused of being an extremist and it was I took away from that like extremists are okay depending on what you're going to the extreme about and it was just like um Jesus was an extremist for love you know love your enemies bless them that curse you do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you and then there are also extremists on the negative side. So I'm okay. I feel like I was an extremist on the positive side. And I thought that was a good point to make. I could go on and on, but that would take the whole class. So I can go. Who wants to go next? Jason. 
Yeah. Um, I took, uh, there was a quote from um, his, he talked about how um, there was a promise that they made. Um, the promise was eventually broken, though, but that they'd removed the signs with, with, that had racial, racial slurs. And uh, to me, that was like, yeah, despite the fact that they, you know, they put it back up, I think like, um, you know, like we talked about before, like it was it was a small thing, but uh, the little things lead to the big things. And, and like the fact that they were, yeah, even though they brought they put it back up, but the fact that they um, even considered to take it down kind of kind of shows you that um, like even if they didn't think that they were willing to move like in that direction of like uh, racial equality, they 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 did. The, the fact that they decided to take down the signs kind of shows a lot. It, it speaks volumes, even though it's just a sign. Well, I mean, given, you know, the context of the sign is, is still a pretty big thing, but like just some as little as taking down that sign kind of shows a lot that even though they put it back up, there was still like, it shows like that they were willing to um, move towards that direction. At least that's how I saw it. I guess I'm more cynical they would want to appear to be, right? Because the whole nation's looking at them. Right, but like, um, like just the fact that, you know, they that they did it, you know, does that make sense? It's kind of, it, you're, they're still breaking ground. I mean, it, it might not be a lot of ground, but they're still, they're still breaking ground. But I don't know, like you said, maybe you are, <laughs> I don't want to, yeah, maybe you are. That, I don't know, but there, there are reasons why people should appear to be uh, less racist than they are. Um, but Jason, uh, hope springs eternal. Maybe you're right. <laughs> okay, who else? Anybody want to comment on Jason or go next? Um, this isn't a comment, but... I do want to say it was the John Lewis act you were talking about. I finally found it. I don't know much about it, but I do remember that it was them trying to redo an, a previous act and that the Supreme Court, they're just trying to delay it to where they don't have to vote on it. Yeah, the Shelby, they, they, the Supreme Court removed certain protections to make sure everyone could vote. And when those got removed, all these voter suppression laws came up. And so John Lewis is trying to bring back some of that stuff. Um, the Supreme Court is made up of a bunch of wealthy white people that lived in the burbs and wanted to be a Supreme Court justice and they will defend the status quo which means they defend wealthy white people. I'm sorry. That's the way their decisions are coming out. And if you look at deferred immunity, again, I will post that. It's really horrible. Um, so that's what we've got right now. Um, John Lewis got beaten 60 times for what he believed in. Um, he, it's a great story. He was a uh, family of eight kids, um, what are those servants, you know, they worked on the land, they were super poor, but he managed. Um, okay, who wants to go after Jason? Trey, go ahead. So reading from the passage, uh, I got like something that I just wanted a little bit more like answers on, but I'm probably not gonna get the answers for it. It said in the past, it said white citizen counselors or KKK are more devoted to order than justice. So I was just thinking about like why, why, it, why they would have done that or why they would have done the things that they did. Cause to me, it just seems like they're just, uh, constructing like a negative piece if you know what I mean so like they're they're they for for one there's not really they didn't I, I don't see a reason for them you know doing the things that they did what are you referring to the things that they did like like hanging and and you know oh. uh, there's a lot of stuff that like they did 
but I can't, I don't, I don't really know all the like, you know, I like we all know what happened, but you know, just keep it to peace. The lynching, you mean? Yeah, all that crazy stuff. Well, they want to put fear in the hearts of African Americans, so they cow right. But like, as in like thinking of like thing, like thinking like that, like I don't really see like a a a, a thing in what black people did to deserve that. If you know what oh, I'm saying? Nothing. <laughs> right. uh, it's white supremacy, really. Donald Trump's father, grandfather, were KKK. Um, a lot of respected people, a lot of mayors of towns. Yeah, they they really, it's about power and um, yeah. But it's crazy cause like, I mean, they already had the power. So I'm not really like understanding what more they could have wanted in, in doing that to like African-Americans and stuff like that. Go ahead, Michael. I was just gonna say like, um, so in like, um, in some of the psychology courses that I've been involved with, uh, like social psych, for example, um, they talk a lot about like maintaining the maintaining the power gradient. And so, you know, when you when you're getting to this point where African Americans are, you know, they're they're beginning to you know fight for the rights that they deserve, um, you kind of destabilize the power gradient that these white people wanted. Um, which in turn led, I, I think, led to uh, some some more like I'm not going to say more extreme because obviously this is all throughout history. Um, but I, don't know. I do think the shrinking middle class is a huge problem because a lot of the people who are in these white movements, their grandparents had very well paid, very stable union jobs. And so that's hard, right? It's hard that you don't have a plan for having a couple kids in a stable middle-class house. So you definitely want to find someone to blame or want to cling to what you've got, right? You're, you're afraid of losing what you've got. Does that make sense to you, Trey? Does that, Michael, is that what you learned in, um, it doesn't make sense to you, Trey. <laughs> oh, okay, go ahead. Michael, did you learn anything in social psych about that? Um, uh, not particularly, but that does make, like, that does make sense. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very backward. It's very like wrong, but obviously kind of like what you were saying, they were afraid of losing what they had, which is, yeah, which like obviously Trey was like, no, it doesn't make sense because it doesn't make sense. Uh, like, I agree. Uh, go ahead. Who wants to go next? Okay. I just want to make a, I just want to make a quick comment. So, like, um, I took a push AP US history, and we talked about like, um, the KKK had began like as a secret fraternity, like a prank. They would go around, um, scaring. African Americans in their like homes and stuff, but then it progressed onto something bigger to, you know, what we know today as the KKK. So yeah. Oh, so one of my students, um, we were doing hate groups. Um, the class after them this class, but we don't have time. <laughs> um, she called up a KKK bookstore and um, said, I'm doing, you know, interviews about hate groups. And KKK is registered on the Southern Poverty Law Center. He goes, it's not a hate group. I don't hate anybody, right? I just want a better world for my children, right? Everybody understand that? Okay, Trey, does that help understand? He just really thinks he wants to make sure his kids are taken care of. And then he thinks, you know, Blacks are going to compete, right? Does that make sense, Trey? But like, I'm not understanding. Like, they y'all already have power and, and we start a group to scare. I'm not really seeing what like the black people was doing to 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 be started to you know start the group. 
You feel me? Uh, I, yeah, it's, but it's I, so... I already said it. Like, I'm not going to get no answers. There is, I don't think I'm going to get an answer, but... It, well, the other thing to do is to blame those elite humanist liberals. <laughs> They're the ones. It's their fault because they set up affirmative action or something like that. And let's all blame them. Um, so I don't know if any of you have heard rumors about affirmative action, but there are really false ideas about what it did. You never had to hire someone who was not qualified ever. Um, so among the qualified people, you were supposed to hire uh, proportionate to the racial uh, climate, you know, the proportion, uh, racial proportions in the area where your business is. And that meant, you know, that you'd have to hire, but they had to be qualified, never, ever. I know that because I used to call them into my class when I taught business ethics. I just know that there were a lot of false ideas, but the Supreme Court eliminated affirmative action. So there's really no problem anymore. So ta-ta, <laughs> uh, which I don't agree with, but all right. Um, who hasn't spoken yet? McKesney? I got confused. Like we were talking about, we was talk. We were talking about humanism. Class number ten, July nineteenth. It's all on the stream. I don't see it on the stream. Okay. Well, from now on, if if you don't see something on the stream for each class, you you should email me, right? Um, okay, we need to move on though. If if you don't, you know, if you want to pass, that's okay. Do you want to pass? I'll pass it. Okay, Caitlin, do you have something? Uh, yeah. So I picked one of the same ones that Mary Hannah did about the comment about Hitler. Um, I just thought it was a good quote to use because a lot of times um, people will just go along with laws and stuff because it's what people, it's what you're supposed to do and sometimes it's, it's just unjust and I think a lot of like corrupt leaders have put unjust laws in place and there's just been some that have always been in place that need to be changed and that's something that we need to like work towards. Then another quote that I picked was, um, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor and it, it must be demanded by the oppressed. And so I think that's a big one for like the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, without like, like they talk, someone talked about the violence and how um, it, there comes a point where when people aren't listening, it gets frustrating. And like you said, the undercover police and all that situation, but like it's not just going to be given without putting up a fight, and I think I think that's wrong, but it's just it's just a fact. So, all right. So, I think I'll go to the outline and try to do you know a few minutes on this. Um, so here's okay. One outline is just about. Um, this is like the cheat sheet. Um, so the problem with outsiders, this happened with Black Lives Matter. Injustice anywhere, that's still true in Black Lives Matter. You deplore the demonstrations, but you don't think about the causes underneath them. That's still true. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four steps. They that's still a very good plan. Uh, there, the, it wasn't as obviously organized. There were plenty of people doing that, but it wasn't as pervasive as it had been in the 60s. 
It doesn't mean people weren't nonviolent because most of them were. Um, we have, let's see, it's untimely, right? You just have to wait. And that's always an excuse for not changing things. So all of you during your lifetime, I think climate is gonna be something where you can't wait, right? You must change the economic system, uh, but whatever it is, right? There's gonna be things where people will say, oh, it's creating too much instability or it's leading to violence is no, you know, if people would accept it and move ahead, it wouldn't create instability, it wouldn't create violence. Um, our willingness to break laws, right? There, there is a natural standard for justice and injustice against which any one country or leader is accountable. That is the Western tradition. It's a cornerstone because the alternative is whatever the monarch says goes, whatever the aristocracy says goes, whatever the dictator says goes. The Western tradition has been no. The rule of law and the laws of any one country are accountable to a higher standard. And that was the Greeks had that. The Delphi, the Oracle at Delphi was like the United Nations. People came from all the other city states to get advice about justice and injustice. Um, the play Antigone is exactly about that. She engages in disobedience by burying her brother, even though he was a traitor. She thought the laws of God are more important than the laws of man. And she got, you know, Creon uh, put her in a cave. And um, instead of giving him a chance to rethink, she went and hung herself right away. And he changed his mind, but it was too late. She kind of overreacts. But OK, so this notion of natural law theory, St. Thomas Aquinas, very, very standard Western uh, Muslim, there is a Muslim version of natural law theory also. Um, okay, just laws, unjust laws, this is still true. Sometimes it's it's just on its face, right? This is an old Aristotelian thing, right? It might, that's the virtue of knowing uh, a law that should be able to create a middle class, but then how to apply the laws, that's another virtue, the virtue of equity. That's the virtue of a judge and a jury. Um, okay, then defying the laws, right? And, and you need to think about this, right? right? Because the people who conducted the January 6th insurrection claim to be conservative, right? And to follow the rule of law, but they were trying to stop, you know, the official um, acceptance of the election results. And so, you know, some people call that a, a coup and some people call that, uh, you know, the truth, truth and justice. So, you know, we're right in the middle of all the same stuff, folks. Um, but one thing about the January 6th, it did not try to be nonviolent, that's for sure, whatever else it was. Um, there's nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience all the way in the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, prophet, the whole prophetic tradition. The white moderate is um, more concerned with order. That's a problem. Um, people who say they care, but they don't do anything. Uh, Minneapolis, the Twin Cities have a lot of people that live in the city, but they live in really upper middle class neighborhoods in the city. And Minneapolis is trying pass a law where all the new housing has to be multiple family housing to try and get middle class housing in the city. Because what they have is upper class and then ghetto. And they really need a middle class. The school system suffers from that because the wealthy put their kids in private schools if they want to stay in the city or else they leave. And then you just have, you know, the schools, 
that you're just trying to create a middle class and that those, I call them limousine liberals, right? <laughs> they like to say they're liberal, but they have, you know, a very cushy life, they're protected. Um, so uh, those would be the ones, you know, these liberals that King was frustrated with. Um, he was called the white moderate, right? Um, he's not an extremist, right? Um, this is still true. Oppressed people can't stay repressed forever. That's still true. Um, okay. The church, hey guys, think about this. Is the church just a social club? Is your church a social club? Is your church saying just you know, it's about eternal life. We're not supposed to worry about social change. Is it, you know, against social justice that that's too worldly, that's humanist, you know, secularist or not? Um, he's pretty fed up with that. He really thinks a Christian should be an activist for the truth. And like, and he compares that to Jesus. Uh, so you can think about that. Then there's Jesus. I mean, then there's um, America. Our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. We were a democracy and then we had slaves. It's really not the way to go. And there were plenty of founders that knew that in the future, people were going to have to work this out. Um, the police force keeping order, but it's excessive, right? That happened under Black Lives Matter. Uh, the okay, the police, you know, police behavior, big issue. How do you deal with that? And it's not easy, but there are limits beyond which you cannot go. Um, all right. So I'm hoping that you'll think that, you know, a lot of these patterns still exist. And then, um, all right, on these notes, I had the four points for um, just more specific. Um, okay, so that's it. Anybody else want to make any final comments about Martin Luther King's uh, letter? Um. I did want to make one more comment. I was looking back through my highlights and it was a last paragraph on page nine and I had connected his thoughts with like, we talked about how black lives matter and religion, um, whether we thought Christianity and whatnot, but it said, in spite of my shattered dreams, I came to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious leadership of this community would see the justice of our cause. And um, I think he's just saying like, I thought we were better Christians or religious people than to let things like this go on but then he said but again I've been disappointed and I felt like for him because it's been he's been disappointed up until today and I just still think it's kind of crazy that it still goes on knowing how many religious leaders have not done much of anything to step in after 9-11 it sort of went backwards actually um and it was, we got to get back to God. It was, God allowed this to happen because our country was being taken over by the humanists, right? And the feminists and the liberals and the relativists. And you do need to know this because this is a polarization, right? This to me, even if people don't explicitly say these things, this is the underlying, you know, stuff that goes on. I think. Um, all right, so any other comments before we move to the next related issue? Okay, so the reading for today is, um, I tried to focus you on the humanism and Black Lives Matter, the, um, so this is Black Lives Matter and it brings in humanism. So hopefully, you know, you can see where the readings are dovetailing into each other. 
And then I had um, the news. I brought this stuff back again about intolerance, right? Religious intolerance. That was after 9-11. Then I talked about, I did want you to read, here are the manifestos once again in a different form before they were at the end of the reading of Corliss Lamont. Um, but then there was the anti-humanist, right? The anti-humanists and what they claimed, right? That the heathens rage and people imagine vain things. And um, let's see, let me just, okay, so. Uh, we can redefine the family, control the Earth's climate, climate, abolish inequality by redistributing wealth, achieve bodily perfection via embryonic stem cell research, human cloning, genetic engineering, that's all humanism. And it's, it's the serpent, right? It's the devil because people want autonomy from God. It's a man-made utopia. Um, all right, so the, okay, hopefully you read that, but first, uh, whatever you guys brought, I'm gonna start with. So what did you bring with you, Titus? Let me get to it. Well, this one is from the first article, the ones with the black, the one about the black humanist alliance. Yep. Mm. One, it was really one quote I had, and it basically said, let me see this. Yes, it was basically saying that while the Black Human Alliance concerns itself with confronting expressions of religious hegemony and public policy, we are also devoted to confronting social economic and political deprivations that disproportionately impact, impact Black America due to centuries of cruel tea and ingrained prejudice. Basically, they were saying that, or the way I interpreted it was that they, people were relying on religion to solve it, but it has not worked up to this point. So basically, they've been forced to take the humanist view instead of continuing to believe in religion when it hasn't really gotten them anywhere or at least not as far as they wanted to go and i think i had one other quote about that but i cannot find it right now okay. if you come back to me i'll have it right so I mean, I thought of you in your last paper, right? So this you might want to write your third paper where you just have this sort of, you know, uh, strain of thought. But Martin Luther King represents the union of reason and faith. There's really no gap between reason and faith, natural law, Socrates. That is the uh rock bottom foundational point of view, right? And then you have, right, the black humanists are branching more toward humanism. And because religion is disappointing, it's become more of a social club. I mean, they would say, yeah, Martin Luther King talked about that. The churches have become just social clubs. So we're just gonna go with humanism because this, you know, religion is being used for all sorts of nasty stuff. Um, does that make sense to you, though, Titus, that when you read Martin Luther King and then you read this, you're starting to think, OK, this is related to what I'm thinking about. Yes, and I actually found the other quote. It okay. turns out to be the very next paragraph. I thought it was on the first page somewhere, but this more directly relates to the paper that I wrote. And it was basically saying, without the subtext of a higher power, we focus on instruction, problem solving, community building, and direct action and recognition that issues for learning systems of oppressions are intertwined but to activate, to actively challenge social inequality. It is imperative that our critical thinking tools aren't limited only to 
scrutinizing hocus pocus and god beliefs so i like that one actually a bit better than my first than the first quote because it's more relatable to what i wrote and kind of what i believe okay i mean i this is one case where i can my own experience is unlike my students experience and so i just want them to freely think right liberate your mind and think and what you think will be based on your experience but keep you know try to develop the most self-critical accurate you know meaningful uh idea of wisdom you can based on you know reason and faith whatever you're thinking okay so akaya what do you think um well when i read the when i read the article i um focused on the um the letter that was wrote to nancy pelosi okay um it just talked about um well, it talked about like the police brutalities and how um, they should have more history and knowledge on these police officers before they're like hired. It talked about the uh, officer who killed George Floyd, how he had like 18 misconducts. And then there was another one. Um, what was it? At? it well, it was a little, it was a 12 year old boy who had got killed and it talked about the police officer and how he, um, I think he was like fired from his last job or something. And then he had resigned from a future job. I just feel like that's very important because you have all these, this police brutality who's aimed towards African-Americans and it just makes you feel like, well, these are white supremacy people with a badge and they're just, they're racist people who are killing these African-Americans because they're police officers. So they think it's okay because they have a badge and a gun when in reality, it's because of these um, problems that they had in their past jobs. And I just feel like it's important to know that when hiring a police officer, so you don't have these future problems that continue to occur. There's also a problem that we have become a war state. We've been at war for 18 years. And so we have a whole class, a military class. And a lot of people, come back from the war and then become police officers, but without any counseling about PTSD, right? And so they've had, I understand this, they've had these very destabilizing experiences. They sign up for being in situations and no counseling, no therapy, no recognition that this is a difficult job. And so, you know, it just seems like an absolutely crazy way to operate a society, right? Um, you're just asking for trouble. Um, yeah, and then when you get it, you get all this polarization. Um, does that make sense to you, Akaya? Okay, so I, 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 I'm glad you picked that up because I, did, I didn't wonder, I just wondered if students were gonna read all that stuff, but it's all relevant, right? And, and the patterns are all there. And so if you want to be a good citizen and you want you know this consciousness of a citizen, that's what I want you to realize. It's really important to develop that. Uh, Trey, do you have something? Uh, yeah, so I got from the passage, it says, on behalf of the Leadership Conference of Civil and Human Rights, um, it's, oh, I don't really know this word, but uh, a collation char is, that might be right or wrong, a collation charged by its diverse membership of more than 220 national organizations to promote and protect civil human rights in the United States and the 446 uh, organized or something like that. But um, I just feel like to me that the rules and and all the you know the, the things that we make in our today's society or like have been in the past what we have made kind of like doesn't progress forward if you know what i'm saying like it hasn't really been moving forward like we 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 say we want to treat everybody equally and we say we want to protect everybody's rights but then again we're not really doing the things necessary to protect everybody's rights so um 
that's basically just what I found most interesting in the passage. So if I could, if I could help or change or do something to provide a little bit of help or put some oomph into everybody's heart or something like that, I would. But it's crazy how we just kind of say one thing, but do another thing and don't follow what we, what, what we say we're going to do and what we choose to do. And you just have different actions. I'm saying. Again, I think liberal arts education, you're exposed to teachers who all could make more money doing something else. All of them represent some sense of calling. And while you're in college, you're supposed to develop, you know, what can I do? So, for example, someone could read about the problem of housing in African Americans and just decide I am going to spend my life working on housing for African Americans. So that by the end of my career, 40 years from now, the situation will have gotten better. And so you just pick something that you feel like. You're able to do it. You know it's important. And that's the best you can do. Does that make sense, Trey? You just have to dig in your heels somewhere. Does that make sense? OK, good. Um, the reason why people say they care and don't, they get overwhelmed. And then a lot of them are actually doing something that's important. It just isn't that thing that's important. And then when you have kids, it's very hard, as Socrates, how much do you just put up and shut up, right, and tell your kids to do what the teacher says, even though the situation, you know, you can't tell a kindergartner, oh, your teacher's racist, <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, it's, it's hard. I, my niece came home one day and told her mom in kindergarten, the teacher yells at the black boys more than the other kids, right? What are you going to do? You know, it's just really hard. Um, but that's where I think you just pick something and say, I'm going to make progress on this. And that'll, that's what you can do. So Mary Hannah, what about you? Uh, are you the, are you mute? I was still muted. I'm sorry. I completely okay. forgot that. I was answering in my head, I guess. Um, just connecting them. I, it also talked about the private school voucher programs again. And I just feel like always going back to that, um, middle class standpoint, but then it said that I like how it said the vouchers failed to meet the needs of students most in need. And that just kind of stuck out to me. And I feel like that's the same with a lot of things, not just private school vouchers. Um, yeah, we'll come back to that. So I hope everybody rereads and, and is prepared to discuss it. I mean, it really was horrible, right? During COVID, Betsy DeVos, the billionaire woman who went to Christian private schools, finds a way to get these funds to be given to rich kids, <laughs> you know, that's just outrageous. These kids that need iPads, right? Because this, you know, school is gonna be online. I just, to me, it's hair on fire awful. <laughs> Does that make sense to you, Mary Hannah? Yes, ma'am. Did you realize that she did that? Did you know that the HEROES well Act and the CARES Act? Yeah, I actually did. Yeah, I'd heard about that. Okay, again, if you're a good citizen, you should know about this. Okay, Michael, we're going to run out of time, but I've got your names down, the rest of you, and you're going to get called on next time. Go ahead, Michael. Um, one, I was just going to touch on the kind of what you and Mary were just talking about, but um, I read an article, again, for one of the site classes. Um, and it was about essentially how private schools um, went to shut down during the uh, the pandemic, um, and how like the parents like so like these mostly white rich parents like threw a fit, like absolutely threw a fit that their kids were not going to continue to get this like fancy education or whatever um, during a pandemic. And actually, some of them I believe ended up like reopening 
um, which just kind of illustrates like another like um, you guys were talking about the vouchers and I know we talked about vouchers with respect to some of these like um, private schools but it just kind of illustrates another um, another way that like rich people in education had like such a huge advantage especially uh, in regards to something so recent like the pandemic. Well a lot of them bought came together and they hired, you know, they just could have very high quality stuff for their kids online and they would direct them. I mean, it was just that much more that as long as you understand there's this constant pull to shrink the middle class because rich folk are going to make sure they get their kids get what they need. And then it puts people, unless somebody makes an effort to get the poor in the middle class, it's not inertia. The inertia is constantly shrinking. Um, yeah. So I think I have to, you know, shut shut us down. But okay. So I got Caitlin and um, uh, Jason and Akaya and Lakesni. So you come on next. But please be prepared to talk about the two that reading with that started out with the Black Humanist Alliance and it had 18 pages, but they're important. And then just those three pages of anti-humanism because that's a big issue. So that's a major problem with polarization. Like the anti-humanists say that the humanists think we can control the earth's climate. Wait a sec. <laughs> Fossil fuel is destroying the Earth's climate. If we do nothing, we're going to destroy it. And you're going to say that's what God-fearing people do, where the humanists are the arrogant ones that are trying to stop this because they want to control the climate, you guys. And this really is going on still, right? Uh, they demonize AOC because she's got this green plan for going green. Oh, it's socialism. It's arrogance. It's liberal, you know, hubris trying to control the climate where some, you know, the standard position is God tell, told us, gave us the ability to understand this. If we don't do something, we're going to really roast in hell because we're destroying the creation and we know it. Right. And so definitely in the name of religion, you can say we got to do the climate thing, but that's not the way it's getting polarized. Any effort to change the climate is hubris and lack of faith, as if it hasn't been hubris and greed that caused the climate problems in the first place. Everybody understand that? I hope so. And then just keep doing that, right? Look at this polarization. Check out, you know, how it everything can get twisted. Is that fair to humanism, right? And then is this real Christianity? I want, I'm going to ask you all again, right, on that one. All right, so I will, how many of you actually want me to do the video how many of you want to see it like at 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. tonight? Do any of you look at it? Because I kind of progress. Are you talking about the pre-class video? Yeah, the pre-class. Is anybody okay. going to look at it tonight if I would post it? Because, okay, what happens is um, I do have office hours from 9 to 12, but I could push it if people really want that thing. I've been procrastinating. I think the one yesterday was at 2 a.m. or some dang thing, and I regretted that. But okay, so now nobody's gonna force me to do it earlier. Uh, but I'll, I definitely, I'm, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't let myself do that. So take care, and I will see you tomorrow. And we'll just keep the conversations going. I think we start with Confucianism pretty soon. So I hope you have the book. Um, bye bye. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, can we do reflections on our classmates' papers? Like sure. in our especially since class? that was one of the classes was talking about it. So of course. Okay. That's great. I didn't know if you were gonna post those or oh if we 
will you and okay right. it? Okay, well, you know, let's have a, I'll send an email out to the, the whole class and I'll ask you if you want one of your classmates' papers, do a reply all. And then if that classmate doesn't mind, right? Then they'll send it. Is that okay? Yeah, I want to tell us this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Titus. Uh, do you mind sending it? Yep, I'll send it to you and I can also email it to you if you want, Mary. Okay. Yeah. My email is actually right there in my name if you want it. Okay, but I'll send an all class one and we'll see. Yay. No, that's the whole point, you guys. I want you to talk to each other. Really, you got 50 years. I'm I got 10 more years, whatever. Oh no. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. These kids are gonna kill me. I have to go. <laughs> they, were, they were pretty good. Tell them I, you know, I think they were pretty good. I have three kids. So Do you hear him? Are you not done yet? <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.